And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Bowling Explained. I'm your host, Jason Thomas. Got it. Every show special, but this one's even more so. I I think because you're gonna you're gonna get to hear from one of the true characters in the sport of bowling. Uh, we're gonna talk today about league bowling and how to really boost your average in league. I know it's something you know a lot of people complain about how quote unquote easy the lane conditions are all the time, but uh, you know not everybody can average 240, 250, 260. Uh, this guy has done it in the past, and and he's he's a good good bowler uh, on professional conditions as well. He's got eight uh, PBA regional titles, and uh, as of last check on USBC's Bowl.com Find a Member, uh, two thirty three sport bowling average uh, in the last sport league he bowled on. Um, he is the host of the Outer Range podcast. He's a writer and publisher of the Bowling News. He is a Texas State USBC Hall of Famer, as I mentioned, former uh, PBA Tour player and eight-time regional champion. He's one of the top bowlers in the DFW area uh, and held a 247 league average in the 2017-2018 season. Dozens of 300s and 800s uh, and an all-around hell of a guy. Tony <laughs> Franklin, how are you today, sir? Oh, what a great intro. I appreciate that. I'm doing good, Jason. How about you? I'm <laughs> doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. Were you surprised by the by the Apollo Creed level? Uh, uh, it was it was I good. Mean, it was good. But I, I I mean I I guess I have. That that feels pretty good. I like it. <laughs> I like the I like the dozens of three hundreds and eight hundreds. I, I can't you know? I I mean I, I just I was starting to count them all on bowl.com and I was like, I, I can't count that high. It's just it's crazy how many three hundreds yeah. and eight hundreds you have. It's not the not that plus, many at plus all. I'm sure there's a whole bunch that they didn't even keep track of because you shot them before, uh, before that kind of thing was was, was tracked. That's true. That's yeah. true. Those are all minor from the Wayback Machine. Yeah, I'm, I'm still amazed every time I see you know Barda or see a post from from Barda and he's 200, 205, 210. That's so ridiculous it is. to have that many. It is. It's insane. Uh, and you know, good for him for being able to rack them up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> well, so today I wanted to talk to you. First of all, how are you doing? Like, how what's what's life been treating you like with the pandemic, and what are you up to? Yeah, uh, I would love to get out of the house and back into the office. I think uh, it drives me crazy being at the house all the time. Uh, in Texas, I live in the in the North Dallas area of Frisco, and uh, you know things are open. We can go out and bowl, no problem there. Uh, but, you know, they've redone it with now you got to wear a mask the entire time you're bowling now. So that was a, a recent change. But really just having to work from home for my for my day job uh, is, is not the way I want to do it. I like to be out there. I like to be out there with the people, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Have you bowled 300 with a mask yet? No, I have not. Okay. I have not. Maybe tonight will be the night. Okay. Okay. You got to get that on the resume. Yes. 300 yeah. with a mask. You got yes. to be there with Francois Lavoie. Well, mine won't be televised as much, but <laughs> you could live stream yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, I, first of all, what, what maybe people don't know what you do outside of bowling, and I've been to your work before. Uh, it's, I think it's a pretty cool job. So, so tell people what you do. Yeah. So uh, I work for PepsiCo and specifically Frito Lay. So the Frito Lay corporate office is right here in Plano. I've uh, been with PepsiCo for 20 years. I'm the director of IT for Frito Lay North America. So yeah, you got to come out and, and walk the campus a little bit one day, which is uh, hopefully enjoy that and see. It was. I uh, loved it. You know, we had lunch in the in the huge cafeteria, which overlooks the lake. It's a beautiful campus. I'd love to go back there someday. <laughs> I know what you mean. Luckily, our campus has been open, so it's been nice to be able to to see people and 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 do that kind of thing. But I know uh, you've got a, a few more thousand people working there than than we do. Yeah, yeah. There's, I think, uh, 3,500 to 4,000 that are based out of that building, plus the R and D building for Frito. And you know, other than R and D's got people in it most days. There, there's less than 50 people in our building every day, which is sad for a wow. big, beautiful building like that. But hopefully, uh, you know, we're we're looking maybe in the April time frame to get back in the office, and hopefully that's the case. That'd be nice. That'd be nice. Yep. So give people a little bit of perspective on, I know you've got a long bowling career. There's a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't mention. Uh, the national scratch tournament you won, you know, I think when you were 19, 150 yeah. grand, 
uh, won your first regional title when you were 19. So uh, give people a little bit of a background on what a stud you are in bowling. I guess from from those two comments, it's clear that I peaked early and never, <laughs> never lived up to any uh, expectations. Uh, you, you, hey, uh, real real similar to most people's foundation in bowling. Uh, my parents bowled. I bowled. I, I found a love for the game. I was good at it. Uh, my parents gave me every opportunity to succeed. They drove me all over the Southwest and everywhere else in the United States as a youth bowler to get opportunities. Me and all my friends, lots of great bowlers uh, from DFW, uh, specifically met lots of great friends from other areas, became really close friends with everybody from Wichita. For some reason, the Wichita and the Dallas kids all got along really well and formed lifelong friendships with, with that group of of kids because we were all really good and we all had a lot of fun together and we all wanted to do the same thing was just beat each other's brains out bowling. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure you still do a little bit, right? You know, on occasion, uh, the, there seems to be fewer and fewer of us that bowl as competitively. It's harder. I'm 49 now. I'm, I'm eagerly awaiting the 50 mark oh, yeah. just because, just because, uh, I want to bowl some competition that could potentially throw a bad shot like me on occasion. <laughs> the kids don't throw bad shots. The kids don't, you know, I'll tell you, I was bowling a, a SASBA tournament, which is a, a 50 where you had to be over 50 and then it's a recruiter or maybe we bowled a four person. So it's, I was the guest. It's not good to be the guest at 49 years old. Like the only two games I bowled that tournament was shot 269 and I tied Marshall, met, uh, Marshall Morrison with 269. I shot uh, 259 the last game, tied AJ AJ Rice, I think I do not want to be bowling these guys for a living at all. They're way too good. They never throw a bad shot. Uh, all I mean, I guess it's supposed to make you a better bowler, but it's uh, it's tough out there. Those some of those guys are there just so good. Yeah, I mean, you know, and and you were a guy that you know you were ahead of your time as far as rev rate and and the power game. But um, it's pretty amazing, you know, seeing how the game has evolved and just how much, how much, you know, athleticism and power the, the young players of today have. Yeah. I, I think that's, and I, you know, I remember that from when I was bowling and really grew up bowling on short oil, which was not my friend. Cause the only ball I could throw was a white dot in a lot of cases. And then they started to put oil on the lanes and I, it, I'm sure it's the same way for, for some of these kids. They know they've got the advantage I knew I had the advantage and I knew lots of us that threw it similar with, with the high rev rate had an advantage. Um, there were some, some great bowlers from Texas that hooked it off the lane. If you go back and, um, you know, people watch this, they may remember Tony Gonzalez, uh, who had a wild wind up short armed it. I don't know what his rev rate would have been in today's measurements, but it's amazing. Dino Castillo is still out there competing. He turns 50 next July. So oh, wow. you know, a lot of those guys had huge have and, and, when we were 19, if you could hook it more and the ball went in there with more power, you got more strikes. It was that simple. Whether you made the spare or not didn't matter that much because you always had the five, six, seven bagger. So uh, I guess it's probably similar a little bit not in that regard. Not a whole lot's changed today, but uh, I'll tell you, I don't know that uh, I don't know that the advantage the advantage felt pretty big back then. If you could hook it, yeah, I'll just yeah. say that. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's it's really the same today, just on a different scale. Yeah, um, and and it's a sport. So if you're powerful and athletic, you should have an advantage, right? There's yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree with that at all. You're you're absolutely right. I'm gonna I'm gonna plug my headset in here once. Yeah, second. no worries. Yeah, yeah. I'm back. Okay. Okay. All right, but yeah, it's that's the way it's supposed to be, right? If you put the time and effort into it, and um, you know, I guess I'll lead into that a little bit. Uh, so I, I bowled until just, just as actively until I was 33. And then I took 10 years off. So I didn't bowl from like 33 to 43. Life changed. I had different priorities. And in order to beat those guys, you've got to work on your game. You've got to be working on it. I was at a point where it just wasn't that much fun anymore to go practice. If you don't practice, you know what you do? You get beat. You right. get beat bad. Right. So those who do work hardest on it should get the best results. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, obviously, you've come back and you you uh, you, you still compete, um, but you have certainly, I, I, you know, when I was coming up and, and you came up around the same time, two thirty was pretty much maxed out, like what you could expect mm -hmm. to average in a league. Um, 
then when I started bowling again, by then reactive had come out and people had started to learn how to use it. Uh, 250 all of a sudden was a number that was, that was attainable. It, I mean, it was pretty rare, but people averaged 250 in league. You have averaged 247. I know for sure. I don't yeah. know if you averaged higher than that, but uh, I know on record on, on bowl.com you're as of, you know, two years ago, averaged 247 in a league. So what's the, what's the difference in mindset? You've always been able to strike, but what's the difference in mindset of being able to average, you know, ridiculous numbers? You know, I was thinking about that when we talked about this topic. Uh, I remember back at show place, you back in the days, you'd average high two twenties, low two thirties, but to get to a high or, you know, low two thirty, but to, to get to a high two thirty or two forty, not possible, not right. possible. And that place was easy. And a lot of places were easy. You just couldn't do it because you'd miss hits. Right. Uh, in today's world though, if you get the right ball, um, that's the, that's the key. You'll you'll get all the strikes. You just have to uh, figure out each week what the move is. So you have to bowl at a center where they don't change that much. If you move more than five boards in it not in an evening, there's no way you're going to average that much. Right, right. That's a, that's a key point because um, I know I know when I first the first league I bowled after taking a while off, I averaged two ten for the first half, and then I realized these balls are so good. All you have to do is hit the pocket and just throw it as a grass. And I averaged 250 for the second half of the league. So I ended up averaging 230 for the season. But there, there was basically the reason like you, you, you'd hit on it. You'd, you'd miss a few hits and, and you would know off your hand that that was a flat 10. And uh, I remember when I, when I averaged that 250 for the second half, I, I would, I was still mentally, the ball would come off my hand and I'd be, oh, that's a flat 10. And it would either slap the 10 out or it messenger it out. And, and you'd carry those two, three hits a game extra that, that were what you need to throw your seven bagger a game to shoot 250. That's right. So, uh, but, but moving is part of it. So how, how do you figure out how to stay in, in a, in a spot for, for a night and not have to, you know, jump three arrows? Yeah, and I, th I think that goes a lot to the center. The center has to be in great condition. They've got to run a consistent shot week, week in and week out. If the goal is to average 250, my goal going into that season wasn't to average 250, but I got there real quick, and I was at 255 forever, it seemed. So then it's, you know, I mean, I, I never changed balls unless it was like an emergency scenario. So I think that's another key ingredient. If you want to average – a bunch on a house shot. You can't drill a ball on the weekend and then bring that in on a Tuesday night and say, Hey, well, I'm going to try this and see what happens. Now that's smart to do because you want to get some games on the ball and see what it does. But if the goal is to see, you know, what you can average or what the possibilities are, you got to find the best ball and throw that ball every week. Like I threw the same ball uh, probably the entire season. If I, I think I did change at one point, but it was to the same ball, just a newer one. Yeah. As yeah, soon yeah. as it starts soaking up oil, it starts flat 10. You know, you can flat 10 for 225 and that's fine and dandy, but not if you're, again, you're trying to shoot 250, it's got to be fresh. And I just drilled the same ball exactly the same way and it reacted for the most part exactly the same. So those are the kind of keys you've got to have if you want to get the seven baggers. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, there's a lot of different ways, obviously, to play the lanes when they're, when they're easy. Um, do you tend to try to play more in the oil and, and tighten your lineup, or do you do you tend to to throw it to the dry? Uh, which way works better for you in terms of carry, and then also not being able to ha have to move too much? Yeah, I think in, in the center that that I bowled uh, in for the last few years, the the hook is the hook hooks. Let yeah. me just say that there's a lot of friction to the right. So you cannot attack it. It's more hook than with my rev rate, slower speed. If it touches the hook, it's gone. So you yeah. have to stay away from that. And then you just over the course of the evening, you just kind of strain it up. So my feet, again, if it'll, I'll move two or three boards in, in, in the night, but I'll move my eyes two or three or four left to just kind of chase it in. So to speak, you have to stay away from the hook. If you hit the hook late down the lane, perfectly fine. Yeah. There, there, there's your off hit. And it blows the rack and everybody's happy. Yeah. But if you if you're trying to go, you know, big left to right or right to left if you're left hand, I mean it's just it's a recipe for one split a game, two splits a night. Again, if you have two splits a night, you're not gonna average two fifty. Right. So 
there's so little room for error um, for something like that to magically happen. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's just so fascinating that, yeah, you got to throw a seven bagger and not split and make your spares. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, it's a tall order. Is there, is there um, A, a mentality that goes with that, that, you know, you're like, what, what is it? I'm assuming, assuming it's just being very aggressive, right? Yeah. I, I, for me, for the, for the, you know, I had a couple of seasons where I really challenged that at actually at two different centers in this particular center. So this is Plano Super Bowl. Um, I, I just got out to a really hot start and then it was just like, man, I've never seen anything like this before uh, to get, to, you know, where it's just 750 every night, 770 every night, 820 every other week. So, you know, it's, those things start to happen. It's a lot of fun. So then, you know, my teammates, then every time I miss, they're giving me the business and I'm like, you know, not trying this. I got to give them a shout out, right? Tina and Terry Taylor, who they'll keep you humble. Let me just say that. It doesn't matter how many, how many 250s you shoot. The first time you sneak one into the 230s, it's like you gave up and quit trying. So, uh, they they'll keep you they'll keep you going at it and we have we had a lot of fun and at the end of the day I was like boy look at this look at all these strikes so, so then you got to really keep it going and then then you start thinking you're great which is the worst possible <laughs> thing you do. so uh, then uh, you have a few off weeks and that's when it sucked up from 255 <laughs> into the 250 range yeah, yeah. and then I had to kind of reset uh, and then you know got back kind of on track. With a new ball, of course, same ball but new ball. Yeah. So those are the types of things. It's uh, I think that's the funniest part. As start as you, as soon as you start thinking you're too good, I mean that's a it's, it's never, yeah, never going to work yeah. out. <laughs> game, this game humbles you. Very it quickly. sure will. Uh, now back to the lane play aspect of it. Yeah. So so uh, to to combine with that line that you were playing, what what. Would the equipment that you were using tend to be a little bit more on the aggressive side, on the weaker side? What? Uh, so for me, I like to throw more uh, slow reacting balls. So if they're slower down the lane, if you throw something too shiny, then again, it's going to bring in maybe more nine baggers. It's also going to bring in more seven counts. So I think that's something for for most people to, to realize is it's it's not playing it safe, but it's keeping the ball in the pocket. And in today's world, if you're in the pocket, with a with a good ball roll and you and you're playing the lanes right, your ball has a really good chance to strike. If it's too aggressive, then you will have to change with that ball at some point in the night. So start with a little bit slower. I'll call it weaker ball to start with because it's going to catch up to it. Yeah. So that's probably one of the reasons I never had to move more than the three, four, five boards every week was because I started off with a ball that was a little weaker. You get away with it early. And then it falls right into being the perfect ball in the second and third game. So those are really, I think, the keys for the house shot play. If you try and get really fancy with it, it's it's just going to get you seven when you don't need seven. Yeah, and I assume part of that is is being able to play a little left of everybody, where you're kind of in your own zone, where you don't have to move, you know, with the traffic. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm going to give a different perspective on that. I know that a lot of people think that. Oh, a high rev rate is going to blow up the lane, or if somebody throws urethane, it's going to make it a certain way. I really don't pay much attention to that, especially this is a trios league. In most cases, uh, I think the majority of leagues these days are trios. The the good leagues, uh, good bowlers want to bowl fast. Uh, five member leagues are few and far between. Didn't was was Jeff Carter when he averaged the two sixty? Was that on a five member league? It was, yeah. It was yeah, yeah. Which is. Just it's makes insane. that, and it was a scratch league, so it was you know a bunch of guys doing it like him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I I don't know that it matters a whole lot. You know, bowling with Terry, he's he's all over the place anyway, uh, and that place hooks so much. So Tina's, you know, she's hammering it up, twelve or thirteen or fourteen all night long, and you know we're all striking. Yeah, uh, and then you got people from every angle. So I I honestly, you know, you bowled 30, 36 weeks. We bowled with every different type of player. It didn't matter. Yeah, yeah. So, so then I, I know people like to talk about that and worry about if somebody blows up the condition. But on a house shot, what difference does it really make? Honestly, yeah. I, I couldn't, I could not show you something where I said, oh yeah, it definitely made a difference because this person threw that ball. I, yeah, no, yeah, no. Now, now, from frame to frame, now I, I threw a lot of three hundred games away in league just because I would go high flush and then I would move the next shot and I'd flat ten or ring ten. Um, 
and and I think that was because I had more of a tournament bowling mentality where, you know, it's better to, to ring a 10 and stay ahead of the transition than to, to big four. Uh, what is What was your mentality when it came to that kind of thing in league? Jason, that's a good question. That's a really good uh, difference maker because in tournament play, totally different deal. You've got you've got to make the move because you can't give away that shot. Uh, but on a house condition, because I'm still always trying to stay in the little five board zone because I know that's where the money's at. Uh, just throw it harder. You know, you, you'll pitch it a little bit. You'll throw it harder. Take a little bit off of it. As long as it keeps the same ang- angle, it's got the right chance to strike. So I've found success with that uh, in most cases. I would say the younger generation, they'll just keep moving left and that's fine. You know, we got lots of great bowlers again, younger ones here in town that I'm just fascinated by watching them bowl. You've got the Lavery Spars and I mentioned uh, Marshall Morrison and, you know, AJ Chapman lives here now and those guys, they'll, they'll be six hours left or six arrows left to you in a flash uh, on a house shot. And it's, it's, it's awesome to watch, but that's not for me. I feel yeah. like I, I, I mean, I can compete with those guys on something like that because they're going to bring in some wild shots where like worst case, maybe if I don't make the, it's, it's still four pin. It's a flat 10, you know, it's worst case. And again, if you're trying to shoot two fifties on a house shot, that's a, it's a good way to, to do it is to keep your ball in the pocket. Yeah. Yeah. Now you, you mentioned, you know, kind of the, the, the strategy as far as like where in the arsenal, the, the, the ball that you would typically like to use on, on a league condition, but what do you use different equipment for league specifically than you would use like in a, in a regional or, or a more difficult, you know, sport pattern? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's the part where, uh, I would definitely say it's going to be different. Um, you know, the, the place I'm going to bowl in, in league in tonight, I've tried some different balls there. I only have one that works good and it works really good there. So, you know, it's, it's wild to see those types of things on really difficult conditions because, or more difficult conditions, we won't just call them really difficult. Yeah. You've got to have uh, balls that really, really make moves at different parts of the lane. And, and, you know, when you had Sean Rash on here, he's talked a lot about that arsenal and what it's going to be to be able to see different motion and all of those things. But how shot, uh, you don't need anything tricky, to be yeah. quite honest. Yeah. And that's interesting. It brings up another point. I remember I, I went out to Baltimore to shoot Danny Wiseman's Hall of Fame video. And, and after we did the, the shoot, I went and watched him bowl league. And he was averaging, I think, 245 to 248, somewhere yeah. in that range. And uh, the night, that night he shot like 750, I think, ish. And uh, there was he threw a shot in the third game. And he basically told me, like, I maybe make like four good shots a game that I would consider good back in the day when I was sharp on tour. Um, maybe three a game at most or four at most. Yeah. And, but, but he missed the pocket once that night. And I'll, I'll never forget it because the look on his face when he came back after he missed the pocket was like he threw the ball so bad that <laughs> – like, and it, what it told me was like he has to throw the ball so bad to miss the pocket on what he's bowling on. And, and it goes to a point that uh, – John Gaines quote that, that I think you probably have heard a million times and, and it's, it's thrown around a lot, but which is throw it bad from somewhere else. Uh, and the thing I see with league bowlers a lot is, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll miss the pocket and they'll just be in the wrong part of the lane and you'll say, just move. And then, well, I didn't throw it very good. Well, you, you don't have to throw it that good to strike on this. That's right. Right. So, That's so right. yeah. What, what advice would you have for people that, that say I didn't throw it good enough on yeah, a league no, That That is the perfect advice, right? Uh, you've got to, you, you know, I think most people are going to look for three or four really good shots a game. Right. Of course, Danny's probably under, underselling himself something fierce right there because he's, you know, as, as far as, I mean, there's no prettier bowler to watch in the world than him. Super long slide, super, you know, smooth in the lane. I mean, he was one of the all time greats to watch bowl and great talent. Uh, but yeah, you've got to move. I, I think that's the I think that's the thing that people struggle with the most is that they We'll wait until it's a good shot, but they're not sure if it's a good shot because the good shot probably resulted about exactly the same as the bad shot did. They both got seven. Now what? Right. Now we're now we're five frames later. So that is the advice. You've got to move. Um, I, you know, I I uh, went out and watched the youth tournament this weekend. There, the Chris Barnes tournament here in town, scholarship youth tournament, fantastic tournament. Lots of great talent out there. Uh, really been watching the kids bowl 
more and more. And, uh, and that's the thing is that it takes time to understand lane play and when to move. And I think that would be something I would say for any coach of any good youth bowler or up and coming collegiate bowler is just move. What, yeah. What's the, what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, and I know I didn't move enough probably in my young career because you really didn't have to. You you would wait on it. There were spots in the lane where you could strike from. It's different today. You can create it. So just you just move. There's nothing bad that can happen. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned youth bowling, and um, I know there's a lot of great tournaments out there for youth bowlers. A lot of them are on sport patterns. A, a lot of youth bowlers that I I've, I've talked to recently – they have kind of given up bowling on league patterns, which, you know, I never really understood. I, I've always been of the philosophy that, you know, it's sometimes it's just good to, to see your ball strike. Um, what is your opinion on that whole thing? And what do you think people, you know, kids can learn from bowling on, on, you know, easier patterns? So the most important thing to learn is you've got to, you've got to get strikes in this game. Uh, when you bowl on the tougher conditions, sport conditions, really, really challenging stuff all the time, then you're going to have that defensive mentality. And guess what? The great bowlers in the world aren't, and that's defensive. Yeah. You know, they'll, sure, you're going to bowl a bad couple of games to start it if they're if they're pretty tough, but they're going to break down. And you've got to get six strikes a game, seven strikes a game, in a row to to make the big scores. And that's the thing is, if you don't bowl on enough patterns where you can create some strings then in your head what do you have to go back to you're bowling a tournament it's pretty tough it's in the sixth frame i got to strike out for 220 to make the cut but i never throw a six bagger so how can i possibly dig deep in my heart and say i can do this i can get the six bagger if i've never had one or i don't get them often so that's the deal i, I know at least back in the day when when all of us were growing up we bowled on a lot of house shots and a lot of the big tournaments were ugly but you'd figured out it just takes a little bit to figure it out you're already talented enough so you don't have to practice on it you can't practice playing 40 or you know fifth sixth seventh arrow on a house shot or anything tough it's only during the event that you can get that true practice. It's expensive practice to get, but that's how you get it. So then, at least I knew in my head, oh, I've thrown lots of seven baggers. If I need one now, I guess I'll just I'll go get it, right? And that's what I see uh, from a lot of the kids these days is they just don't have that gear because they don't get an opportunity. They're working on their game, which is great. I'm I'm totally impressed by all the talent, uh, but that is there's a missing piece there, and I think. Uh, this is something, you know, we've talked about in the past. I'm not seeing enough young talent challenge the top talent on the professional level. I'm just not seeing enough of it. The the guys that are bowling good, you know, you know how old uh, Jason Belmonte is and Bill O'Neill, those guys are 39, 37 years old. You know, Shannon O'Keefe's 40 years old. I mean, where is the younger talent? And I just think that they're potentially, they're not seeing – all of the types of shots they need to. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, it feels like um, there's, I, I call it firepower, but like we had Brandy Brank on our show earlier this week. And, you know, she was, she was always known as a player that is, is good when she has to grind it out. But then when it's a shootout, she struggles. Now she just recently set, you know, the Illinois state record right. with an 868 series. And so I asked her the question, do you, do you think that, you know, just having the mentality of knowing that you can strike that much is going to help you on the PWBA tour. And I think she said, yeah, I think, I think it does help because there are times when, you know, those players like Belmo, it, it feels like he's bowling on league. It might not happen for the whole tournament, but he'll get to a point in the tournament where, you know, he feels like he's got a bunch of room to miss where it feels like league and you have to be able to strike with him if you want to be able to compete. And, and I think yeah. you're right. There, there, there's just a, an element that's missing in terms of just the, the confidence to be able to strike that much, which league can, can give you. Right. Absolutely. Uh, that's the deal is you've got to have in your memory bank, you have to know that you've done it before and you've done it when you need it, when your heart's racing the most that builds confidence. And that is critical to anyone who's trying to climb the ladder of success, they've got to have that. And the bowling on a house shot is not a bad place to get it. You know, I, I saw uh, an interview, this was a couple of years ago with uh, 
uh, Brad Angelo. And I, I think it was Brad Miller that was doing the interview. This was in the early Brad and Kyle days, I think. Uh, and they were asking him, what do you like to bowl on? You know, Brad Angelo, I kind of consider him a grinder. He's good on the tough stuff. And, you know, he's he's New York tough. I mean, he, he's going to grind it out. And he said he likes to bowl on house shots, practice on house shots, because he, he wants to see his ball roll the way it's supposed to and strike. He'll figure out where to play. Right. So there, there's something there that I think people are missing. I, you get a top talent like that. He's like, oh, yeah, I want to see my ball strike six times in a row. Yeah, I, I agree. Right. In practice, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, I, I always thought it was interesting. I, I got in an argument one time with Walter A. Williams about, you know, he, he, he was very insistent that you should always practice on difficult conditions. And I, I always thought it was interesting that when I bowled on easier conditions, I actually made better shots because I wasn't worried about, you know, what I didn't have to do. I was just worried about what I did have to do. And um, it, it just felt like when I had all this room to play with, I didn't need it because I, my, my, my swing would loosen up. Right. And so do you feel like that's something that, uh, uh, you know, more players these days need to need to, you know, get a little bit more of a taste of, you know, that, that's a, it's a, it's a tough one to say. I mean, I don't want to argue with Walter Ray Williams <laughs> yeah, on, right. I didn't on, either, what it, but... on what it takes to win 50 titles, but he won a, he won a By lot the way, of he's titles. He's a guy who never cuts the ball short. He's always aggressive, right? No yeah. matter, no matter what. And yeah. whether they're, they're dead walled or whether, you know, he's bowling on the U S open pattern. Yeah. And, and there's probably a different way to look at it. Uh, it's all about the hook spot, right? You've got to find the hook spot or create a hook spot. And if you can do that, then you can be aggressive. That's the whole goal is to be able to uh, throw it as, as hard as you can with as much on it as you can. And once it hits the hook spot, it's in the pocket. That's that's what any good bowler is out there looking for when they're getting lined up in practice or a couple of fill shots during games that aren't that great. They're trying to find the hook spot. And to your point, I think that's a great way to look at it, to be really aggressive. I mean, Walter Ray didn't leave anything in the bag. He couldn't even keep his shirt tucked in because he was pulling <laughs> right. through it so hard. Right. So, I mean, he was definitely going after every shot as hard as he could. Yeah. Now, is there is there a – I have a theory uh, about shooting 900. We actually tried to do it with the robot downstairs. We, we, yeah. did, we did it for a season and a half or so. And, you know, the best we did was when, when uh, Wes Malott came in and drove it for us and he shot 8, 820 or 815, something like that. But – I, I, my theory is it's harder for a robot to shoot 900 because he's not missing everywhere. Uh, do you build that into when you're trying to play on easier conditions? Like, do you, wor you worry too much about where you're throwing it or do you just try to get in a place on the lane where you know it's going to strike no matter where you throw it? Um, so, so for me, I would say I, I always try and flush every shot. That's pro I would say that is, goes on my list of Tony malfunctions in the game of bowling is that I try and flush every shot and I probably shouldn't worry about that. But if it goes light, maybe I'll try and move. If it, if it goes half 10, I might try and move to flush it. And I'm sure I've got myself in way too much trouble through the years and I don't do that as much anymore, but I still try and flush every shot. And I don't know why I just feel like that's my best shot, best chance to carry. So I, I think that that's a, again, I, so then you just go in, okay, well, Hey, if I miss a little bit all over the place and of course I'm throwing it all over the place enough, right? I'm not, uh, I'm not Walter Ray Williams. So I'm going to miss where I'm looking and circle one and come up the back of the other one. But uh, mentally I do try and flush every shot. So I will, I will gladly own up to that as my goal. Anytime I'm out bowling. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, point. I, I, you know, I, I don't know if you saw the show we did with Tom Frenzel where he, it showed like the pocket percentage uh, based on where you place the ball in the pocket, how often it strikes. But but basically flush is your your best statistical chance of striking. And then half pocket's basically 50 to 60%. And then you go yeah. light pocket where it's a light mixer, it goes up to like 80%. So I know Tommy Jones will line up for light mixer. Um, and if he goes, if he goes high flush, he's moving. There's, there's, he's not going to stay there. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's interesting that you, you say that you line up flush and that gives you, you think your best chance to, to, to strike. 
Yeah, uh, and that's why Tommy Jones has twenty titles, uh, and I have zero <laughs> titles. But but I'll tell you that. So there. So you know, more I think about it, the reason why is I hate two eight tenning. Like leaving the two eight ten is unsparable for a right hander. So I hate to leave it. So if I'm light, I am about a board away from a two eight ten. I I hook the ball too much. I never leave a bucket. Like even yeah, if I left a yeah. bucket, wouldn't know how to spare it if I left it. I've never <laughs> left one. But I will two a ten anytime I miss right where I shouldn't. Gotcha. But if I go if I go through the face and leave you know three three four six seven ten, I can spare that all day long. That's yeah. like that's like a five pin to me, right? Because <laughs> I leave it so much. So in my head, I have over the years decided that's the way I want to play it. Tommy Jones, though, the much smarter way to play it. Because yeah, and that's the way the, the the best bowlers in the world. If they go flush, they will move on the next shot. They do not want to four pin. They do not want to give up a a big four potential where they could have just gone light half pocket struck with no problem. Yeah, so and I, and it was interesting because when we did the journey to nine hundred, we were trying to play it safe, and so we were a lot of times we were trying to line up half pocket because we knew if we missed a little right, it would light mixer, and if we if we missed a little left, it would be flush. Whereas if we tried to line up flush and we missed a little bit, it, it was a four nine or, yeah. or a big four. Uh, but but we didn't score very high because hitting half pocket doesn't give you a lot of high scores. No, not at not at the ITRC. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're trying to carry a, a half ten or a trip four there, that ain't gonna happen. Yeah, good luck. Good yeah, luck. that's not good gonna luck. happen. So so, do you think there's anything missing with? I mean. Uh, there's way better and way more coaching than when we were kids growing up, way more knowledge, a lot of yeah. more uh, things are available on YouTube and other places for information. But do you think there is something missing in the development of the players of today uh, that goes to this confidence building thing? Yeah, I, I think the main thing is that uh, the game is much more. You're, first off, you're right. There's so much great coaching out there. The science of today's game, rev rates, ball entry angles, all of the stuff that's available via the specto machines and all that stuff is great. Uh, but the one thing is missing is it is harder. The moves are tougher. The, move, the moves are more aggressive. So with that being the case, I don't. you can't learn that in practice. You can't learn that bowling on a tough condition. You can only learn it in the fire when it's on you to make a shot that counts and make a move, move three left and change balls. And you've got to have a strike on that shot. You can't reproduce that in the, uh, in the lab. Right. Yeah. So I think that the game is tougher from that. And that's why you see uh, the talented bowlers don't become champions until they're 28 years old in a lot of cases. And sometimes by then, it's not happening there. The, yeah. It's, it's few and far between. I, there's so many of these great talented bowlers. You just keep waiting year by year. And now they're 28, 29 and they haven't won or they've won one time. And I think that's because it just takes that long to get so good with the moves. And I'm talking about guys that are phenomenal top players on both the male and the female tours. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I know when we talked on the PWBA podcast with some of the younger players, that it always seems like it's the issue that they feel like is holding them back is they just don't understand as, as how to make the moves as quickly when they see transition as, as the Shannon O'Keefe's and the Liz Johnson's and, mm -hmm. and, you know, the Kelly Kulik's and, 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 but it's, it's also, it starts to turn into almost like a confidence issue at some point where they just, yeah. you know, feel like they're at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. You, yeah, you don't, you don't have very long to make it, to make that move. Uh, you got a couple of frames at most, yeah. right? And that's what makes it so so difficult and so impressive for the the Belmos and the and the EJ Tackets of the world. Those guys make wildly quick moves and wild moves. You know, five board move is their move. Yeah, right. Yeah, and yeah. that's what's so impressive to watch. But you again, you can't teach that. You can't teach it in the lab. You can't. The, the transition that you see Shannon O'Keefe make, she's not making that when she's practicing at home. When she's practicing at home, she's working on all the fundamentals to be sharp. It's the game play when she's on the lane and it counts. That is the key. And that's what uh, we're just struggling to get a lot of the up and comers uh, that experience quick enough. Yeah, I think it, uh, uh, some of it comes down to imagination. I mean, you know, the, I think one of the reasons why Bel Belmo is a great player is if you watch him practice, 
Like, let's say you watch him practice, you know, prior to a, a match at the Masters. And this is kind of where I, I realized this by watching him was when he was on that, you know, he's still on the run of, of winning the Masters, yeah. you know, almost every year. But if you watch him practice prior to a match, he'll throw he'll throw shots in you know three or four different zones, and he'll look like he's completely lost all the way through practice. And then the lights will come on, and he will pick where he wants to play and start striking. And if he doesn't strike, he'll he'll switch to a different zone. But he basically has all the information about what that lane is doing, and it's a completely different way of of figuring out how to line up because I think. I think for the most part, people now are trying to carve the lane up for themselves, make them better for themselves. And he just doesn't think that way. He just knows that it's going to get good for me at some point. I don't need to make it good for me yeah. now and give away my hand. I can, I can keep this other person guessing and figure it out on the fly. And that's almost like, seems like where the game has evolved to at this point. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah. I'm, Wherever he starts, he's going to be 40 left of that by the end of the tournament anyway, and that's probably where he's going to be shooting 279 every game with to finish, right? So wherever he starts, is he's going to be way, way, way left of that, and that's makes it difficult on a lot of the players that don't have that uh, that rev rate, which it, it's a shame. I want to see. I like the variety. I like the variety of the talent. Uh, you know, that's what really kind of makes Bill O'Neill so just amazing, in that he doesn't have that massive uh, rev rate and angle. He does it with a lot straighter angles. Still gets it done. Yeah. Impressive. Impressive. Yeah. And, and an interesting thing about O'Neill, we have Rob Galchall now working for, for USBC, and he was a rep for, for Bill for a long time. He said Bill O'Neill was amazing, that he could, he could tell Bill a very complicated move that he wanted him to make, and Bill, without even missing a, a beat, first shot, would be able to do it exactly, which is pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, the, you know, think about the level of talent. All right, so so uh, I know you you had a, a forty five minute uh, uh, window that you wanted to get this done in. So last question, unless we think of any more that you want to you want to go past the forty five minutes. Uh, we mentioned in the open, people tend to complain about lead conditions, um, and talking about them being too easy. Um, I always thought of it as you just, it's just relative. You go out and bowl. If you're a good bowler, you, you, you're you honest with yourself. You know, you know, maybe you shoot 750, but you didn't throw it very good. You're honest with yourself and you, you go, hey, I need to practice. What is your perspective on how to, you're a tournament bowler and a league bowler also on how to balance, you know, both? Because I think we want to see people bowling both leagues and yeah. tournaments, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, there's nothing wrong with bowling a house shot. There's nothing wrong with bowling at a place that's really easy. I think there's different levels of easy. You know, I'll tell you the, the place that I'm bowling uh, league at tonight, they're, it's not the easiest place in town at all. And it's it's actually a lot of fun. It's easy in its own spot. It's not 247 average easy, uh, but it's 230 average easy. So with that, I'm still getting to work on all the things I care about when I'm out there bowling. Uh, How's my footwork? How's my repetition? At the end of the day, all you're trying to do is throw it the same way twice. The way you want to throw it, throw it the same way twice. That's the key to bowling. And then after you do it two times in a row, you need to do it for the next five shots. So that's what we're talking about here. Uh, and at the end of the day, however you uh, get there is how you get there. If you bowl in a house shot or you bowl tournament shots, but it's all the house shot stuff is just building that repetition without doing something funky to your game so that you're prepared when you go bowl the tournament and uh, and they're not, you know, they're, they're tougher, but it's no big deal because it, you're throwing this, you know, the shots, the way you want to throw them consecutively, consecutively is the key. Yeah. 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 And, and keep a healthy attitude. I, and you mentioned, you know, having it go to your head a little bit. And that's usually when uh, the train's coming on the other side of the track, right? Boy, isn't that <laughs> true? Isn't that the truth? I, I, I tell you, yeah, that's 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 it. Uh, <laughs> I've read some good books on that. Is as soon as you start thinking you're you're too good, then you know, like you said, bowling's very humbling. It'll there's a there's a big four hiding around the next corner. I can guarantee you that. Uh, as is life. Uh, that is true. That is true. <laughs> that is true. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to come on the show, sir. 
Well, hey, Jason, uh, I really appreciate it too. I can't believe that I was the, the house shot expert. Uh, <laughs> all this, so I don't know how to take that. Take I, it be, as a compliment. I am going to take it. I'm not going to be offended that I'm house shot guy now. But no, well, maybe, I, maybe I, we'll have you on to talk about the mental game next time. We could do that too, as long as we don't have me on to talk about like how to hit tough conditions. You continue to get that. <laughs> you continue to get that top talent on there for that. Like, I, I I need them a little bit softer as as mold as most of us uh, do as we get older. It's your damn good at it. Hmm. <laughs> well, again, thanks for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate it. Yep, absolutely, Jason. And thanks again for all you guys do. I, I love uh, I love all the variety that we're getting now. So the only good thing about COVID is all the great podcasts, and video <laughs> things that, that you guys have done and everyone else has done. So it gives us all something to do uh, to, to watch people and, and listen to bowling stories that we just haven't had that much opportunity. So yeah, yeah. thank you for that. You're welcome. You're welcome. Hopefully we'll find a way to keep it going uh, when we have tournaments starting up in January too. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. Stay safe. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas coming up. And uh, we'll have you on again. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks. for uh, Appreciate uh, it. For being, Thanks, being Jason. With us. Yep. Yep. That was Tony Franklin, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, fun conversation. Fun guy. Uh, heck of a bowler. And, uh, you know, th I think the message that came across is that league bowling is not bad. Uh, it's a good thing. Uh, it can help you get better. Um, I know a lot of people out there think you have to avoid these easy conditions if you want to get better, but there are uh, times when, when it can help you. Uh, times when you're struggling to see the ball strike, uh, sometimes bowling on a lead condition is the best thing you can do to get your game back healthy again. So hopefully the, the, the little insights that Tony was able to share will help you uh, in your own in your own bowling game. If you have questions, uh, we'll, we'll uh, go ahead and leave them in the uh, YouTube channel on Bowl TV or here on Facebook. We'll try to get back to you with, with answers. But I uh, hope you enjoyed the show today. Uh, we've got another good episode of uh, uh, Inside the OC coming up later this week uh, on Thursday with uh, Matt and Aaron. And also the uh, final uh, final entry into our 20 Greatest Seasons countdown coming up on Friday. So be sure to check back on the uh, uh, Bowl TV Facebook page and also the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, to find out who is number one on our list. But I uh, hope you enjoyed the show today. Um, remember to uh, to check us out on uh, USBC Sport of Bowling Facebook page and the Bowl TV YouTube channel as well as BowlTV.com. And remember on Bowl TV, bowling lives here.